In the last video, we looked at a step-by-step -step example of applying AdaBoost to a, a particular data set. There was still a few of the core details missing in the algorithm. Um, and that's what we'll look at in this video. So within the training iterations here, uh, I'll just step through steps A, B, and C in a little bit more detail. So in step A, it says fit model FB so that it minimizes the classification error weighted by um, the training item weights. Okay, and you can write that out a little bit more precisely. The goal here in step A is to minimize the sum over all our training items from n, a little n1 to big N. So here I'm going to use this indicator function and I'm just going to write out the mistakes that we make on our training items like this. So let's just look at this. Remember the indicator function returns a one if the, the statement inside the curly braces is true a zero otherwise. So if I just look at this expression here, it basically says count up the number of times that my model FB um, gives an output which isn't the same as the true output, the thing I'm trying to um, predict. Okay, so if I just look at this sum here, that basically says how many times I'm, am I misclassifying a training item. Okay, and the goal in step A here, in this, this first step, is to minimize the number of mistakes that I make. Now, this objective is just what we've always been trying to do when training any classification model, right? You always want to make as few mistakes as possible. So for a decision tree, for example, you know how to how we try and, and train a model which gets as few mistakes as possible. Similarly, with logistic regression, you know how to train a model to, to try and minimize the number of mistakes we make. The one difference here is that we weigh the classification error rate by Wn. So that means we get a little term here, Wn, which basically tells us how important is this specific training item, okay? How important is it that we don't make a mistake on here? So in other words, if we do make a mistake, we're going to add Wn. Uh, if we don't make a mistake, we'll just add um, zero. So that's just step A in a little bit more detail. Um, step B, and there's actually a, a bit of detail missing here as well. Um, specifically, I didn't talk about what this error term um, epsilon is. Well, um, where does that come from? Um, I did say lambda b just intuitively if I have a classifier that's good then I want to have a large lambda b. Uh, if I have a classifier that's bad then I want a small lambda b. Okay but how does that how does that pan out? So this epsilon is actually a normalized error term. What you do is you count the um, weighted um, classification error rate Okay, which is actually just this equation up here. Okay, so the indicator function y n not equal to f b x n theta b, and then you normalize that classification error by uh, just the sum of all of the different weights. Let's just move this here. So what does this mean? If um, this epsilon terms goes to zero, what does that mean? That means that my current um, classifier, FB, the thing I'm currently training, is a very good classifier. Okay, so a very good classifier. Okay, we're making very, very few mistakes here. Okay, so that's zero, um, or that's tending towards zero, this whole thing tends towards zero, and epsilon will go to zero. What will happen to my lambda if that happens? So we've got one minus something that's close to zero divided by something that's close to zero. So this is going to get uh, become very, very big. Um, and, and that means that the result is that we will get a large uh, lambda. Okay. If on the other hand, um, epsilon Let's just think, what will epsilon be for a very, very bad classifier, okay? Um, at first, when I looked at this, I thought, well, 
epsilon will be um, will be very large, right? It will be basically one. Okay, you get all you get all of your points wrong here, so you just get one, 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 one. Then uh, you get um, the sum of w n divided by sum of w n. Okay, um, that's not actually exactly right. And the mistake with that is that a classifier that's that has an epsilon of one, that means it's getting every single training data point wrong. Okay. Now I can actually turn that into a very accurate classifier by simply predicting one whenever that classifier predicts minus one or predicting minus one when that classifier predicts one. Okay. So you will never get this setting where, where your epsilon becomes a one. Actually, the worst classifier that you can get is just tossing a coin at every training item. Okay, and if you do that, um, you can convince yourself that epsilon will go towards a half, right? Um, that's a very bad classifier. It's basically a random classifier. Okay, and if we have a random classifier, so then we've got epsilon goes to a half. What happens to my lambda? So here we've got one minus a half, that's a half divided by a half. So we've got a half divided by a half, that's one. The log of one is zero. So when that happens, uh, as my classifier um, gets a, a normalized error that goes to a half, then I will have a lambda b that basically goes to zero. Okay, and that's exactly what we want. If we have a good classifier, then we want a, la a large lambda. If we have a fairly bad classifier, something that for the binary case is just flipping coins, then our lambda b will go to zero. Finally, let's just look at step c in a little bit more detail. So what you can go and do is you can take this equation here and you can substitute that in to the equations here and here for correct and for incorrect predictions. Okay, and you can go and do that and then what you'll see is for correct predictions, you um, update your weights for the training items where, uh, which according to this model um, is classified correctly. We update their weights by multiplying it with epsilon divided by one minus epsilon. Okay, and the ink for the points that this um, classifier doesn't get correct, um, we're taking the current weight w n and we're multiplying it by one minus epsilon divided by epsilon. Okay, now let's just see what what's happening here. Let's say we've got a fairly good classifier. That means that epsilon is going towards zero. Okay. Um, and if we've got a good classifier, let's say we're looking at a point that was classified correctly, then we've got something close to zero divided by one minus zero. Okay. And the square root of something close to zero will also be close to zero. In other words, we're going to make the weight for a training item that we got right, we're going to make that um, smaller. Okay, way smaller. Okay, let's say we're still looking at a very good classifier. Okay, so epsilon is close to zero. And now we look at the point that we get incorrect. That means we're taking one minus zero, which is just one, divided by something that's going towards zero. That means that this thing is going to get very, very big. Okay, and that means we're going to update the weights for the stuff that we're not getting correct. We're going to update their weights by making it a lot bigger than it was before. Now let's look at the case where we've got a fairly bad classifier, close to random. Okay, so then epsilon is tending towards a half. You can go and convince yourself here that you'll get, um, for a point that's correct, you'll get a half divided by one minus a half. That's just one square root of one. In other words, you basically leave the weights unchanged for training points that you correct, get correct with this bad classifier. What do you do with points that are incorrect? Basically the same thing. You get one minus something that's close to a half divided by a half. That's a half over a half. So that becomes the square root of one close to one. And again, um, you're going to leave the, change, uh, the weights unchanged. In other words, for a bad classifier, something that's close to random, we basically don't touch the training point weights. And that's actually everything that you need to understand the Adaboost um, algorithm. 
I should say that we basically looked at the existing algorithm and then just interpreted how the different steps, um, what each of the steps um, do. Um, but there's a lot of backing behind um, these bo boosting algorithms. And if you're interested in that, I think there's a, a couple of very, very good resources to go and look at. The first is by Raul Rojas, and I think I completely butchered his name, um, but the tutorial is called Ada Boost and the Super Bowl of Classifiers, a tutorial introduction to adaptive boosting, um, written in 2009. You can just Google for that and you'll, you'll get a PDF. And that gives a, a very, very nice overview, a little bit more in depth um, of where this Ada Boost algorithm comes from. The second resource is uh, Elements of Statistical Learning Theory. Um, a very very known a well-known textbook you can go and look at, at chapter 10 which also gives uh, a, a lot of details on on the different boosting algorithms so boosting can be used with any type of um, of base model here I talked about trees and one reason for this is that boosted trees are actually used very often in practice um, a lot of machine learning competitions are, are one with uh, variants of boosting, not exactly this this algorithm, but algorithms um, similar to this using the same types of principle that um, boosts uh, decision trees um, to get a very, very good classification performance.